just got okay here we go let's go to the musical critique so this is one way that i have found incredibly restorative and you're going to see my little secret in a minute but this is going to build on your assignment from finding a movie a movie musical that was derived from a musical that was on stage because in our current format anything that you see is going to be through a screen so whether you're watching a play a musical that's on a stage that's been filmed live you're going to see it on a screen we're going to talk today briefly, you know, the difference between seeing a play and seeing a play on screen and then seeing a musical, a film of a musical. So building on this assignment, if you hated your musical, I want you to pick one that you really love. So you're going to watch the movie, find the movie that you wrote about. Okay, this is title your page. What, whatever you want that title to be, whatever the experience is. And this is what you see and what you experienced while you watched the movie. And it's a movie musical, so it's different than just a regular straight narrative. Here's what I want you to include. This is 50 points. It's a pretty big point thing. And in order to get all the points, you just have to do each step. So if you think of titling the page, putting the name of the movie, the date you watched it, include whether you've seen a musical theater performance on which the movie's based, okay? Five points, right? You don't put that in. It's everything is additive. You have to put in every single thing that is asked for. And that's how you accrue points. So it is a regular essay written paragraph form, about 500 words. This is one thing that saved me during the pandemic. Roger Derling is the Santa Barbara International Film Festival Executive Director. He's also a instructor here at Santa Barbara City College. He's in the film studies department. <clears throat> And generally every year there is a Santa Barbara International Film Festival 10 day intensive um, course, which is amazing because then anybody here can go take and see all these movies that are brought in, some from brand new, new, new and dynamic directors. Some of them are like going to be hits and then major stars are brought in. And Roger is the one that is responsible for bringing this from an idea to the absolute international sensation that it is today. How many have ever seen a movie at the International Film Festival? You absolutely should take advantage of it. Have any of you done the film festival class? So that's something you can look forward to. Maybe next spring we'll be in the position where we'll be able to resume going to see musicals, uh, movies, and it is amazing because you can go to the Arlington Theater and you can see like five of the biggest stars of screen. So when I worked on The Artist and I came here in 2011, then in 2012, both uh, Jean and Bernice Bergerdeau came and they were from The Artist and they were here on the Arlington stage. It was really fun. It was fun to see them for me, but it's fun for the audience to see the movie. And then, wow, the stars basically walk right off screen. Well, I've even gone to a movie at the Riviera Theater, that is where the Santa Barbara International Film Festival is based, and they run movies all year. And Roger will somehow get the star of the movie to come and do a live Q&A afterwards. So he realizes the, the importance of being able to actually see and interact with that person afterwards. So he writes a great response to a film. And almost every time I get him an email and he has written one a day for the entire pandemic. So I know that when that comes in my email and trust me, I get 75 to hundred emails every day. That's just on one account. And then I have the city college account, which is ugh, overwhelming. But um, 
I look forward to that because it's uplifting. He finds a way to review all kinds of things, old movies, new movies, musicals, you know, things from the 40s, 50s, 60s, something that really just, he gives just an incredible response. So the idea of this is you want me to watch your movie. So you wanna talk about what it's like. So here's what he brings to it. And I've copied this right off of the email. And he's always very welcoming. Dear Cinephiles, the blues help you get out of bed in the morning. You get up knowing you ain't alone. There's something else in the world. Something else been added by that song. This be an empty world without the blues. Ma Rainey. So he, he takes a quote that really touched his heart from the movie, the musical. Then he talks about the director. And then he talks about exactly what we're working on. The tricky part in bringing such an innately theatrical work, which is Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, okay? It's August Wilson's play. It's a musical I saw it um, a few years ago. And he, George C. Wolfe is, is the one that directed it for the movies. But he's talking about the contrast between a theatrical work seen on stage to the screen, honoring its roots while understanding that you work in a completely different realm. So this is something that you need to be thinking about when you're watching your movie and when you look at the difference between a movie and a musical. So Wolf, George C. Wolf, and if you wanna see somebody interesting, you can look him up. He finds a balance, a world that feels heightened because again, that's what we have in musical. The language soars, feels cinematic and fluid. And then now he's honing in on one particular actor, okay? And he's gonna discuss how that character is realized. And then here's what the narrative is about. Um, it gives a bit of the, the importance of Ma Rainey and what she's done. He makes it move swiftly. Here's the tempo of the piece. And he ends with a great quote. So that's something that's kind of interesting. And then I've included here, this is a picture. This is um, Viola Davis from, it's an image from the film so that you can see it's very exciting. You can actually see it on Netflix. And then this is the official PR release for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. And you can get a lot of information on George C. Wolf. So this is part of what we did before is get, take one of the originators of your Broadway play and then discuss them and find out some interesting factoids that were, that you didn't know before. Then he talks about, this is how he brought it to page to stage, page to screen, which is very interesting, or we say script to screen. And this is a really important way to understand how you go from one to the other. And right here, Wolf dug into the script. He found it fascinating that it's Wilson's only play not set in Pittsburgh, but Chicago, at a time when thousands of black people were making their way north. So I think he's doing this treaty, this treatise about the adverse dynamics of the great migration and the consequences of what happens when people leave the rural South for the urban North. So that is the theme of the movie. That's the overarching action that is driving this movie forward is looking at these consequences when this great migration North happened for this entire culture. So then he discusses that. So take a look at that. And then Chadwick Bosman is the one who plays that incredible trumpeter and talking about all that. Okay. So this is, this is like, for me, this is really feeds my soul because it's somebody who's looking at something in a very detailed and critical way. It's very exciting. And then he shares it in a way that makes me wanna see 
that movie. It makes me want to have an experience that takes me from where I am to where I am somewhere else. So in a way, that's a, that's a vacation. It's a vacation for two or three hours. It's a vacation in your own world, but you can dive into this visual and oral world and be completely encompassed all through by this, by this story. And then really good credence to August Wilson, who is a contemporary playwright. And he's written a series of 10 plays, which you may have heard about, Jitney, Recycling, uh, a lot of important work. Oldest, um, what is that one? And then about George C. Wolfe. Okay, here are your guidelines. So please uh, digest this in a little more um, information. Title of page, please be very descriptive about where you saw the movie. So there's a difference between watching it on your phone and making dinner. Yes, this is what I would do. I'm bringing that up because I know how tricky you guys are trying to get your homework done. I had one kid say, I have two screens and I'm on this screen, I'm playing the lecture and on this screen, I'm doing my, <laughs> so, you know, but it's important to be, uh, maybe allow yourself the privilege, because what we have now is time alone. Allow yourself the privilege of taking this time to just let yourself go. Let yourself be in the story. Just don't try and multitask. Don't try and do something else. And I know, I think it was Cara yesterday, she said, she said you know, even though everything's shut down and my work is shut down, somehow I feel busier than ever. But this time, and I agree, I can, I can understand that pressures seem to build up and you feel like you have more to do than ever, but just try and let yourself have this short vacation of diving into this movie. Think about these things. Where are you gonna watch it? How are you gonna watch it? Because your enjoyment will be increased if you focus on watching and experiencing it as opposed to doing it while something else is going on. You know, if you're watching a movie for whatever pleasure reason, and you're what I, this is what I choose to do it when I'm boning the chicken or boning the turkey for the soup, because we make soup every day here. I mean, once a week at least. So it's like, okay, menial task, and I can watch this movie. But so I want you to note that, and I want you to tell me how, and where you're watching your movie, okay? And then you're gonna name the mu movie musical, the date included, whether you have seen a performance of this on stage, because that will give you a different perspective than just if you've seen the movie. And there's a lot of times there's a big change between that. You're welcome to bring that in if you'd like. The second paragraph, what is the overarching theme of the musical? So I, I, I showed you what, George Wolfe thought as the director, here's what I really think that the story is telling us. So think about that. And then try and answer that question in a couple of sentences. You know, this story, this movie is really about this and see if you can write a sentence about it and have it distilled to one word. So, in the second paragraph, that's what you're going to put. That's a discussion. You know, that's like five sentences. It's not, this story is about love. Okay, next paragraph. And the reason why I'm being so specific is because I've gotten these where they said number one, number two, number three. Not, I'm not, I don't, I want a response from you. I want to know how you feel about it. Okay. All right. And write about the director and acting style. What style did the director choose for this production? Briefly include a comment about the acting style and if one actor fully embodied the character, just like Roger brought up Chaz, Chaswick Bozeman who did the character of Levy and how that character unfolded. So discuss how the dialogue unfolds. 
in what style or tempo was the language of the dialogue. So earlier, what is the balance of this? What is the balance of that? Now, can anybody, what do you think about when, when I say what style did the director choose for this production, this movie? Um, sorry, is the second paragraph only about what the story is about? Yes. Are we, okay. And that should be okay, a very good question. So that is not telling me the plot. Do you know the difference between that? Should we have a little bit of talk about what the plot is versus what the theme of the play is, the theme yeah. of the musical? I, I don't know that I know the difference. Yeah, okay, great, perfect. I mean, that's a perfect thing to bring up. That's why I'm spending some time on this because often we get to this part and you're writing something and you realize, I don't, I don't think I really understand what, what I'm supposed to do here. Okay, what is a plot? Anybody understand a plot of a story, a play, a book or whatever? When we talk about plot. It's the sequence of events. A sequence of events. So uh, how does that, what does that tell? That's a great statement. What does that tell the rest of you? This sequence of events. It's the story. It's the story, but how is that different? Because I want to say this story is about. So what about the sequence of events? What can we say a sequence of events will, will uh, I'm just trying not to say it out loud and talk about everything. I'd like you guys to try and like, let's try and kind of dig this out. So a sequence of events implies a beginning, a middle and an end. And the phrase that I use is who does what to whom. So this is what happened, then they did this, then they went to this, and then they did this, this person met this, and then that happened at the end. So when you're talking about the linear path of the narrative, that is not the theme. The theme is something that you, is not actually written on the page. You can't just capture it. You can't just say, oh yeah, that's it. So it is, it is when you look at the whole piece, what is the most important thing at the end that you're thinking about? So let's think about some, a common um, play. How many of you know the story of Romeo and Juliet? Or how many of you do not know the story of Romeo and Juliet? Is that something that is familiar to everyone? We need to have a common ground. Otherwise we can pick something else. Everybody is good with Romeo and Juliet. Excellent. Okay, because if you don't, if you don't understand, if you don't have any kind of basic idea about it, then this is hard to have. So tell me, uh, Colby, what would be the sequence of events for Romeo and Juliet? Just uh, it doesn't even matter if you're right. What do you remember? And then as we get there, other people, please be encouraged to add to the conversation. Um, these two rival families don't like each other and a kid from each family falls in love with the other and it's forbidden. And at the end, they kill themselves. Okay. So... That's a very brief um, plot outline. What? Yeah, I know a lot of other stuff happens, but it's about star-crossed lovers that are, okay. it's about forbidden love. They're not allowed to be together. Okay. So what are some of the other key events that happen that help us see that? There's like, oh, uh, there's a lot of family murders. I think Romeo's best friend dies and like Juliet's cousin dies. It's just a lot of death in between too. Okay, so there's a lot of death before they kill themselves. So oh, they also get married. <laughs> right, they also get married. Okay. And uh, any anything else? 
Okay. So then Colby, then you brought up what you think is the theme. What is that? You stated that at the end. Um, the forbidden love. Okay. Young lovers. This story is about forbidden love. This, I'm gonna, we're gonna put that as the second paragraph. This story is about forbidden love. You don't need to tell me the first part about the sequence, about this person meets this person, they fall in love, at the end they die. You know, the, the family, they, they're from, and again, it's exactly what we talked about from West Side Story. These two people from rival gangs fall in love, at the end they die, or one dies. Okay, so why is that idea of forbidden love interesting. Why does a story like that last for over 400 years? Because people will always like root for love and them to get together. It's just interesting. Okay, so people want to root for love. People want to root for success in love. Maybe that's what you're talking about. What else? I think that in some way, I think that some people can also relate to it. Um, maybe not exactly as it's depicted in the in, in Romeo and Juliet, but I think in some way people can definitely um, draw some parallels from it. Yeah, um, maybe you've had a maybe you have admired or or even fallen in love with someone and it has been reciprocated. First, there's that very tenuous part about will it be reciprocated from somebody that is really not someone your family could accept, you know, so, and you can identify with that kind of a feeling. Or maybe there's another barrier, like it's a cultural barrier. You don't actually speak the same language, which creates a, a, a barrier. And sometimes that can be a frustration point. Interracial and, marriages too. What's that, Sue? Interracial marriages. You cut, oh. cut black people and white people. That's yep. something there's a barrier with that. Yes. And that could be, that could create a, um, such a heightened emotional background on both sides that to reach across and fall in love with someone with, of a different race could be considered a forbidden love. So when you, when we talk about the th overarching theme, it's something that is a universal truth. So when, he, when uh, Wolf talked about Ma Rainey, he's talking about that, that part of yourself, the fabric of your life that's ripped out and left behind when you have to go and relocate to a new location if, as the overarching theme, and then to have the same obstacles that you left still be in place, still be not accepted, still have to deal with racism, still have to deal with not being welcomed, even in the place that you're performing. So, you know, that part of renting the fabric of your life, leaving it behind, leaving back your family and your whole community and going on this journey to, to something we expected to be better and hopefully better and maybe is slightly better. And then getting to that particular place and possibly be disappointed in where you are is also something that is universal. We can probably each think of a time in our lives when maybe we had to leave somewhere because we were forced to by our parents or by circumstances outside of our control. I mean, in this pandemic, I can think of several people who, you know, had to move and leave and go somewhere else and live where they could have more support, even if it was undesirable, like, uh, you know, I know a young guy and his girlfriend had to move several states away so they could move into his parents' basement, you know. So there's, there's the, that idea of leaving behind something, 
going on a journey and then getting to a place where where its survival is is more possible but maybe some great disappointment so we can all appreciate that so the difference between plot and theme is plot is a restating of those physical actions in the play basically that lead to from the beginning through the middle to the end and that takes up a lot of words by the way and you don't need to do that part but what you do need to to state in terms of the theme is what is the universal truth in this that I personally relate to that probably everyone does. And this is why this is, you know, long lasting. So this is the abs, this is the meaning of the play, the meaning of the musical, the meaning of the story. Does that help? Yeah, um, I was just wondering. So it's basically the like overriding concept or idea behind why the characters are doing what they are, essentially, more or less. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's why the characters are doing what they are. Just they, yeah, they can't they can't not do what they're doing. You know, they must respond that way. So correct. I think that would be a good way to think about it. And then tell me why you think that, you know, you can do, use an example, you can, or say how you identify with it, if you feel comfortable with that kind of a concept. But what you wanna do is really sort of, sort of identify something specific and then discuss why you made that choice and how that relates to you and how that shows a journey or an identification or a universal truth. Any other comments on that? Okay. So I don't I don't want you to get to this and then like, oh, I'm just gonna shine this on, you know? Just, I want, this is something we'll carry the entire semester. This is something you carry forward when you're working on anything. If you can get, you know, cut to the chase, get the universal truth, concisely state what's going on in any situation, you'll be so much further ahead. You know, it's like cutting through the fog and you can really, it will really be helpful. All right, let's finish up that. So we now we have our theme right here. We're gonna give us at least five sentences about that. In my, in my mind, a paragraph is about five sentences. So you can state what you think this overarching theme is. And then you can tell me why you think that. So another four, four sentences. So this next paragraph is, is a bigger paragraph. So what about this? What style did the director choose for this production? What kind of options do we have there? When you mostly watch a movie, what are you thinking? What do you think you're seeing? Well, in this case, wouldn't it be the obvious, like a musical? Well, okay, it's a musical. We know that. That's more of a genre, but a style of, of yes, that's correct. But, but when you're seeing it, are you seeing something that is real life? Right? So are you, is it a very realistic production? Do you think this is how it actually was in this time period? This is an earlier time period. Ma Rainey's an earlier time period. Think about the time period of your musical. Do you think that people actually were like that? Or is the director making a choice somehow away from a naturalistic, like people actually act like this, to a different style? So would that be heightened realism? So they're just a little bit elevated from that, okay? Does, does that make sense to everybody? So there's a couple of things here that are, that are tricky and then we'll talk about the acting style too. So those can be two different things. So the director is gonna make a choice. Are we looking at a historical reenactment of this particular time period, this particular slice? So that would be realism. 
What other choices do we have? Heightened realism. Is it just a little bit bigger than the realism? Is the director refocusing this whole production maybe from the viewpoint of a specific person? So then it's not realism. We're not like peering down on top of this town and looking at the whole thing. We're looking at it just through the point of view of one character. So you might wanna think about that. The directors chose the style to be from the viewpoint of one character, which is a very individualistic style. And maybe then it becomes a memory musical. Is it something that someone is remembering? And, and when we work with memory, we have very selective memory, okay? Is it a very abstract musical? So is it taking it and abstracting it into something else? For example, you know, is it going more into a fictionalized feeling? Is it more into a, does the audience, does the, do the actors, this is in theatrical terms, we'd say break the fourth wall, but do they talk directly to the audience in this production? And that can totally happen in a musical. Or is it we're always the viewer and the screen is always the story? So just think about how that would be called presentational because the actor then is saying, do you see what just happened right here? So that is common in cinematic terms as well. So think about that. Even if that happens, the actor has a responsibility and in that, in most productions is very true and real to the character. And then if they step out of the character, that becomes a different kind of thing. So then talk about one of your actors that has really just shown they're so great. Um, you, you have great believability in the actor. That's one of the more important parts. If you believe the actor, they fully embodied the character. So talk about that. How does the dialogue unfold? So in other words, is it snappy? I was just talking to a friend who's a playwright and he said, oh, we had the first reading of this 10 minute play and it was terrible because no one seemed to understand that it's Southern. And the language of the South is slow. Every word has more weight. Every word, even the word itself is drawn out in a Southern accent. So think about this idea of tempo. When you think of somebody living in an urban city in New York, that's gonna be very different than Atlanta, Georgia. So I want you to think about what would you think about, how do they sound in New York? What do you think? When you think of people talking in New York, what are you thinking about? It's faster. Faster, what else? Characterize that. I guess, but maybe that's the same thing. <laughs> what? Stressed. Stressed. No, that's not the same thing as faster. That's very different. They're stressed. And because they're stressed, what happens? They're maybe a little unfriendly. There you go. So, you know, the dialogue is fast, snappy, rude. We're not, we're, there's no niceties involved, you know? And then compare that to what we would think of, and I know it might be difficult for our international people, but compare it to what we would think of what a Southern business meeting would be like. Much more welcoming. The things that you see on the surface may not be the things that are happening underneath. We're gonna put on a very nice uh, face and we will include you. We'll ask you if you'd like a beverage. Would you like to have a cup of coffee? Let's sit down and talk about this. And all the while, the undercurrent of that is the same biting, controversial thing, but the language used to describe it is a very different tenor, okay? So it 
happens at a different speed, it happens with a different accent, and it happens with something else. Then if we even take it to some other place like the Southwest or think about San Antonio, Texas, you're gonna have a very different kind of language because you're gonna have some a language that always will embrace the outdoors, big wide spaces. There, no matter what, you're gonna have that background feeling of being a rancher, even if you've never been a rancher, right? <coughs> because you're in San Antonio. And then Casper and George, think about how that is different from what you think of California. If you had to characterize the language of California, the way people speak to each other, what would you say? I'd say that people are pretty mellow and like the language is like, the spoken language is like really laid back. It's like, dude, you know, like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. George, what do you what would you say in comment to that? Yeah, I agree with that. It's it's just more of mellow and there's not really like a distinctive when you think of like California, no one's gonna say, oh, it's a certain like dialect or like distinctive language rather than someplace like Ant San Antonio. Or it's more of like a southern accent, I guess you can say. Can I add to that? Yes, Sue, because she's from UK. Um <laughs> I used to describe my husband as Laid back because he was a Californian. Oh yeah. So it's much more casual. The language is casual. It's in a very common vernacular. It is not elevated. Okay. It's not formal. I mean, in English, we have very few. In most foreign languages, you have two um, status of language where you have formal language to which you d address people who are older or people you respect or people in a certain position of authority. And then you have the common language between friends, which is casual. Well, in California, there is no other language, right? The governor is casual. I even remember coming from Washington state to California and I'm like, okay, how am I going to describe my, how am I going to describe Venice beach to my parents? So see these girls in their tiny bikinis on their roller skates? Yeah, that's okay. And they can go into a restaurant that way. And the guy that's, you know, juggling the chainsaws, well, you know, that's sort of our local color. You know, it's just, that's why I want you to think about that thing about the dialogue and how that unfolds because it tells you about the geographic location that's happening, tells you about the time period. It tells you, is there a different status between certain things, how people talk to each other, and then how people talk to others or people in authority, okay? And that can be both with animosity or respect or fake respect, right? So think about that. Then the last paragraph talks about the visual elements. Think about how those help you understand the story, okay? And spend some time on that. Oh, yeah, he wore a black shirt. I knew he was a bad guy. That's not enough. So what? <laughs> you know, there's a choice. Every single thing you see in a movie has been specifically selected. And it's different than seeing a play because things can happen during a musical performance of a play that will never happen again. You know, the hoop skirt falls off in the middle of the dance. Yes, that's happened. And that cannot be edited out of the frame. In a movie musical, every single thing is there because it has been carefully designed. And then not only that, designed, put behind, in front of, the actors are performing around, in and around it. And then it's gone through, it's been recorded by filming it. It's gone through editing. So it's, yes, are we going to still leave this part in? Are we going to take this part out? No, we're going to leave this in. And then it's been rearranged to create the story. So everything is very specific. So think about those things. You need to talk about each of the elements that are listed. Each element accrues points. So you get points for talking about the costume, points for talking about the sound, points for talking about the scenic. So think about all of the elements. Uh, and then write a summary paragraph. 
you know, uh, after doing all this, I'm thinking maybe my time was wasted in this movie. Or after doing this, I actually like it better. Or man, you know what? This just took me away from the pandemic for two full hours and all right for that. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Okay, let's look at the last little thing that I wanna show you. And let me see if I have it up on my screen so that I can not do it. And so this is what I'm gonna try and do every time. Uh, how many of you are feeling like maybe you're getting in the swing of it for this semester? Like maybe you're kind of, you're ready to uh, embrace Sue, maybe? Hey, are you feeling a little better today? I have my test. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. It was, I already got my results. It was negative. Excellent. I, I still have a sore throat and stuff, but I'm still, I'm, now I'm thinking maybe it's just a cold. Yeah. How many of you have had a COVID test, by the way? Yeah, excellent. Good job. Good job, everybody. Okay, way to go. Way to go. Just want to add something. Yeah. To that COVID yeah. <laughs> theme. Uh, I am, uh, what do you say? I am free from the quarantine so i oh. am free from corona <laughs> so you're doing uh what we call cartwheels do you know what those are <laughs> yeah it's where you can put your i i've never been able to do them i was a big fail <laughs> that's okay you know i i always i just blamed it on being six feet tall at 12 years old you know i just thought i was just way too awkward i could never make that happen getting those legs up over my knees <laughs> face plant every time. Anyway, how many, can, who can do a cartwheel? Seriously. What is that? <laughs> Sorry, I don't oh, know what it is. Hey. Serafina, I bet you can do it. Okay, if somebody can do it, oh, Liz, 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 you can do it. So if somebody can do it, get your cell phone out and then we'll post it so we can see what it is. That'd be really cool because people don't know what it is. It's this crazy physical I don't know, like upside down thing. <laughs> anyway, all right. I want to show you one thing that hopefully will make this class easier for you. And easier for me, I'm, I'm looking for anything, trust me. All right, let's look at the mods again. Our favorite thing, the course modules. I'm going to try and do this so that I may not get to here's what's happening this week, but I will get to here's what's coming up. So I'll do this every, maybe every couple of weeks, I'll give you a short summary of what we're doing. So, so far we're building our community. And to me, I gotta tell you, that's the most important thing. That's the most important thing about being in theater. It's the most important thing about doing a musical. A musical is where I really got my first serious boyfriend. And you know, it's part of, uh, of being together and doing something that is other than your everyday life. And it's just so great. So you can look at the lecture and the outlines or just the pages that we've gone through. Understand the purpose of an overture. And I've put the overture into your page so you can listen to it again. We listen to the, if you've come late, we listen to the overture from West Side Story. Then you want to make a time to watch your movie musical as we discussed and complete your musical critique assignment, plus the other two assignments. If you haven't had a chance to do those, please make sure those are done. The, um, the assignment of musical, stage musical to movie musical is due today. Then I'd like you to read chapters one through three. And I understand if you don't have the book and just let me, uh, you know, we're going to work on that. So just work on that. I'm going to publish a quiz on Friday night at midnight and it will be due on Tuesday. Okay. And then don't forget that your assignment for your musical critique is due on the 12th. So I'll try and do this at the end of each week or the end of each two weeks. If it feels like we're coming up with a, um, if we're coming up on deadlines so that you know what it is about, okay? So the quiz is has not been written, so don't ask me, but it'll be 25 points 
uh, I think it will probably be short answer. I'm thinking, or maybe it'll be 10 multiple choice and then one short answer. You will always be able to have all of your materials. It'll be open and it'll be open for several days. You will have a two hour block of time in which to complete it. And you can use anything you want. You can use the internet, you can call up your friends, you can do anything. But when I ask you for a response, a short answer response, please make sure that it is authentic and comes from your place of honesty, okay? That's kind of the most important thing to me is I wanna know what you're thinking. Okay, yes, uh, we can uh, go to a breakout room. So anybody that wants to do any kind of chat about anything that we've talked about at the end, I'll open a couple of breakout rooms. You can stay and we'll do that and we'll end a little bit early for that, okay? Let's take a look at a few other things about the early times of American theater. And I'll try and find that little PowerPoint. Oh, where are you? Where are you, my friend? Ah, okay, let's try that. So how many of you have heard this term? Uh, treading the boards. Let me see if I can get this into some sort of, um, how do I make it go to a slideshow? I thought that was like really easy. Um, <laughs> you can press the present button. It's in the, in the right corner. Oh, this, yeah, that's right. Okay, thank you so much. Because when I'm in person, I don't ever use a PowerPoint. I love to write on the board and I try to have it be through the Socratic method of discussion. So how many of you have heard that thing called treading the boards? This comes from this, this phrase of two planks and a passion comes from the idea of you can take two scaffolding planks are two inches thick by 12 feet long by 12 inches wide. So you can put two of those together on a sawhorse and you have a stage. And if you have something that's so important, you can get up there, you can travel that from town to town on your horse, and then you can present something. So this concept of treading the boards actually comes from this idea of sticking two planks on a sawhorse and uh, going to the next town. So for some, as alluded to briefly last time, it's called the Synagogue of Satan. Theater was really a den of iniquity. It was against everything that the church stood for. And this is rather hilarious when you think about the United States being built on religious freedom. However, that didn't mean freedom to, uh, of expression. <laughs> it meant freedom to be exactly the religion that they thought you should be. So it was rejected by the Puritan culture of New England and the Quaker culture of Pennsylvania. Theater was absolutely not to be um, attended, not to be engaged in. If you were a theater practitioner, then you were in crime, you were a thief. If you were a woman, you were definitely a prostitute. There was no possible way that you could be any part of that culture without having this tawdry background. So this is a persistent attitude even among conservatives through the 1970s. And yes, I'm talking about the United States. And I'm talking about a personal experience. I mean, my family had no theater culture and we didn't even, I mean, so I grew up really poor. <laughs> so I saw my first movie, like I think when I was in sixth grade or something, but um, <clears throat> we, it was, it was like, what is that theater thing anyway? And part of the reason why is because it takes you to a whole nother world. What are some other reasons why you think, you guys, you can just shout them out. Why would it be considered to be this um, 
thing of prostitutes and thieves. Any ideas? Is it like the gypsy theme concept? Oh, excellent. Really good bringing that in. So, you know, gypsies, it's a very, first of all, that's a derogatory term. It's a derogatory concept that you would be living in a temporary transitional or or transitory lifestyle going from town to town and that you would maybe be making your living off of doing certain kinds of entertainment. And then while you're doing the entertainment, you send others around to pickpocket and make some more money. So you're not only passing the hat, you're also pickpocketing. Why else might it be? That was a good one, Cara. Just think about the culture of theater and why might it be, you know, something tawdry and not to be engaged in. Um, could it go back to when the church didn't want people putting on these shows if it wasn't for religious purposes? Because if it wasn't like within the Bible, it was, or like making fun of the Bible, it was just thought of as like a sin? Well, now, now that's a really interesting point because during the Middle Ages, uh, we there was great theater during Greek and Roman times. When you do your uh, theater history, you know about that. And then during the Middle Ages, it really died out completely and became traveling town to town. But the church had the passion plays. And so the passion plays were the theater of the moment and they were on religious themes. So the other benefit of those passion plays was that the church was a beneficiary. So any income that came from it and because it brought more audience to the church, they had greater income from it. So that's a very good point to bring up. And that was Kylie, right? So what else? There's something else that I'm thinking of about that really is one of the reasons why you might think that it is sort of a less than respectable profession. Would it be the clothing they wore? Oh, yeah, we talked about that. Yeah, the clothing they wore, the clothing that is seen on stage, as we said, the scantily clad women, and maybe some of the, uh, you know, even the stock characters, the leering old man lusting after the young, beautiful, luscious ingenue, who may be wearing a low cut gown showing decolletage, your bust is busting out of the corset, that kind of thing. Of course, the content and the visual, always something to be keep, kept in mind. And that was just from the audience point of view. <laughs> What else though? There's one thing that I'm thinking of. Um, I was thinking that maybe some of the themes that they dealt with were a little too, um, I don't know, racy or controversial. Yeah, I controversial think. themes, certainly. Uh, you know, they did a lot of themes of may even incest. Um, uh, we, as we said, uh, marrying, or having relationship with the wrong kind of thing. So content certainly was part of it, but I'm going to the real basics. So one of the reasons why, think about when you go to see a performance like this, generally it's in nighttime. Nighttime is when things happen. Nighttime is more dangerous. Nighttime, you can't see around the corner. You don't know what's coming. So if you're going out at nighttime and you're coming back at nighttime and you are unsupervised, then you may be opening yourself up to other things. And then when you're a practitioner, when are you having rehearsals? You know, you're working at night. So when you're, when you're engaged in <clears throat> lengthy, a personal rehearsal, you know, from 7 p.m. till midnight, or especially when you do technical rehearsals and then you're gone from, let's just say you're gone from your family for 12 hours, and they're like, really? It, you're gone for that length of time? So, you know, there's a lot of misunderstanding and there's a lot of uh, preconceived ideas that go along with all this thing about theater. So you, it's interesting to look at from our point of view now where literally, 
you know, a two-year-old can touch a button and see pornography on a screen, which is something that should never happen. But this idea of theater coming from a background that had to overcome this very negative um, and seriously um, less than idea. You also remembering that the Puritans, no, oh, I just lost this idea, but it was, oh, well, the puritanical ethic of, you know, sex is bad, you can't have physical expression. And in the Quaker society, men and women are separated. They go through two separate doors, sit on two separate sides. So anything in terms of having people touch each other or people of the opposite sex interacting and then interacting at night for this kind of an entertainment would be up subject to question. So in the early uh, part of the 1700s, it's really unskilled people. They're untrained. The actors are not trained. They have no idea. It's literally, we're putting these two boards up. There's no playhouses. So it's happening in a barn, in a tavern, and in a public square. So that also brings into question, you know, this, this idea of safety. Uh, you know, you're in a barn and the, and the cows and the pigs are next door. You're, they're, they're cleared out to the, you know, they're cleared out to the field or the pasture and you're standing where they were. Um, taverns, of course, a lot of drinking, rooms above for uh, perhaps untoward um, meeting up of, of people, and public squares where basically everybody can go right through any public place. And this is when we had the town crier stand up on something that was elevated, usually the um, steps in front of a doorway, so that they would be telling you the news. In 1716, we get the first colonial playhouse in Williamsburg, Virginia, and Williamsburg still has an incredible theater history. So it started then and it has continued. They have a great theater tradition there. In 1750, we have professional acting companies coming from Great Britain. No cities welcomed them or had a location for performances. Here, you can go to the barn, you can do this. So the itinerant groups, these touring groups, and it's interesting to think about touring um, at, in this time in the 18th century, when you're coming across by boat, you're traveling by horse and carriage, you have a covered wagon or, you know, how are you getting from place to place? And they go from Nova Scotia, clear up, in uh, you know north in Canada to Philadelphia, and I should have put it in I should have put it in chronolo in uh, geographical order, and I should have put New York and then to Philadelphia and then Charleston and then Barbados and Jamaica. So they'd be taking a boat and then maybe back to Great Britain. But think about the tradition of touring, and now touring is the thing that. Um, will often pay for a Broadway musical. If they have a great idea, and generally when, we'll, we'll talk about the path to Broadway, but, and you saw that in, in the Heights, you can do it out of town, you get a very exciting kind of premise, you start this and then when it finally gets to Broadway, one of the things and one of the reasons why you get backers or people who will put money into you having a production is because they'll see their money, they'll realize their investment and it will pay off for them through a tour. And in, we have huge tours that go through, we have the A cities, which would be New York, Seattle, Atlanta, Chicago, Los Angeles. And then you have the B cities, which are different market. You have the C cities, so that if you have a good touring package and you've pre-sold because you have a tradition of going to these different places, then backers are likely to give you more money. But think about how early that happened. We've been doing that, you know, for over 200 years. And the first thing that really comes is English opera, meaning not sung in Italian, actually sung in English. So so anybody could hear, listen to it. 
they could understand it. it. They weren't just getting this kind of melody stuff happening or these big arias that they couldn't understand. And they're getting it in a different form. They're getting the ballad opera. So it's not a classical opera. It is something that is a satirical play interspersed with simple songs, popular tune and ballads. So with things that are maybe familiar or maybe that melody was familiar to you or that was something that you had heard or understood from the past. Early, some early productions that have good historical or, or have historical importance just because we have a document or we have some, we understand that they happened. The Beggar's Opera by John Gay in 1728 is often referenced as the forerunner to musical theater and ballad operas in the United States. And I will try and always uh, translate to the United States. I know that we'll see later that the term America is used. And I, I think that we need to be more specific and talk about the United States because America, of course, is a continent, which includes Alaska, the Yukon territories, Canada, the US, and Mexico. So uh, unless they're going throughout all of the Americas, and that's not then saying Central and South America, well, I'll just say the US because that is what we're talking about. So Flora is an opera that uh, was in Charleston, very popular in 1735, and The Disappointment in Philadelphia 30 years later. Two of the ballad operas. Another kind of opera is the, the pastiche, which is hodgepodge. And if you know that term modge podge, which is a crafting term where you're taking a bunch of stuff together and you have this product called modge podge, you can put it all on top of it and glue it down. It's sort of like this kind of pasticio. It is a sentimental play with elaborate musical numbers, but dialogue is spoken. So they're talking about the story and the audiences recognize the music because it's borrowed from well-known sources. There was no need to compose something new. You didn't need to uh, make up songs for this. You could use you know, sea shanties, you could use um, folk songs, you could use songs from other other operas that you may have heard and from sources that were uh, in the past. Remember we talked about the fact there was really no repository for the documents that made up a musical. There was no place that said, okay, we're gonna hold all these things together. And we think about the producer holding those things together. They hold the manuscript because by now manuscripts would be on all handwritten. We would be, and with quill pen, we'll hold the costumes, we'll hold the actual physical costumes and set pieces together. But, you know, they didn't have that. So things were parsed out. If this particular song worked really well, they could put it into another song. The first professional company came from London. The London Company of Comedians was managed by Lewis Hallam. And they actually were in residence in the United States and stayed here. The London Company of Comedians. When Hallam died in 1756, it was renamed to the American Company of Comedians. Then after the Revolutionary War, renamed again. And so this is like a hundred years later, it becomes the old American company. Once it became the old American company, now it's been here for over a hundred years in the US suddenly they're going to release and let go of the British themes. And they feel charged with creating a distinctive sense of American character. So they want American themes and it will be from the perspective and the sensibility of Americans. So the themes of settling in a new country, the themes of the old West, the themes of, and you think about after the Revolutionary War, we're getting into the gold rush. We're getting into the great expansion across our continent from east to west coast. So there's a lot of 
big themes that you can talk about because there's a lot of country and a lot of big sky and a lot of conflict. Let's talk about that for a sec. So there we go. That's a bit of an introduction into the very beginning of the musical theater in the US coming from beggar opera and pastiche. So a bunch of stuff stuck together and maybe a little story that we just put play, we put songs into the middle of. I'm trying to get some recorded information from some of these and I think that'll be very fun. I'd like to try and at least do some recorded sounds in each class. So we'll work on that. But otherwise, if anybody has anything, otherwise we'll wrap it up now so that I can open up a couple of breakout rooms if people want to have an individual discussion. So anything else? Well, you know what we can do? We can have an early weekend. All right, so I'll see you all on, on Tuesday. We have our looking forward. Um, oh, Cara, before you came in, I talked about that we did the Thin Man read through last night. Yeah, that was fun. You wanna talk about one, one second, how that, was that your first read through? Um, officially, yes. Okay, so uh, one thing that happens early on in a production after the piece is cast is the director will gather people together and we'll do a read through. And again, this is one of those things that normally we do face to face. We're in a room, we actually get to see them. For me, that's very important as a costume designer, I get to see their physical body. It may be the first time I actually see the actor. And then if there's any last minute measurements we need, we can take advantage of that. We, we can, during the break, take them and do measurements and get any last minute information we need. But this situation, Cara, was somewhat different. So why don't you give it from your perspective? About uh, how many people were there? 24 or something. Yeah, like I think yeah. like 24 or 25. Yeah, I mean, it was obviously rough because it was the first read through anyways. Um, and it was done by Zoom, but it was really, really interesting. Um, for some reason, I'm just not clicking with the thin man. As far as the story goes, it's really confusing to me still. So then when you add all these people I don't know into their new parts, it was like I was taking a lot of notes just trying to keep up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's really interesting to see, to get to see something like that and to see how it'll translate and how like their journey from really getting into character and adding the costumes, which... I think will be amazing. And it's hilarious that every single guy cast has a beard or a mustache. Yeah. Like every guy. Um, How so many, that, the pandemic facial hair. Whoa. Yeah. yeah, that was, that was really interesting. Um, yeah, but just to see this part of the process and to kind of try and figure out like, you know, what the director was thinking when they cast him and um, you know, those kinds of things. It was kind of fun. Now is a thin man, in theory, an older storyline? Yes, and so you can actually watch the movie. I tried, I couldn't make it through it. <laughs> I tried. Yeah, so yeah, you, you, you mean, did it come from pre-1930s? No, the casting, like are, are the characters really supposed to be older like that? Oh, I see what you're saying. More age, established? Age of characters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, so when we come into the Thin Man, and this is important because you guys all are going to see the Thin Man. It's going to be, it's a required part of this show, this class. The characters, the man who is the lead, Nick Charles, of course, is retired. And his wife's father has died and left her all this money and a railroad and a hotel and all this other kind of stuff. So, you know, they do need to be of a certain age. Now, are they 50 or are they 35? You know, that it's clearly we, at this particular point, we will be going with the 
people that were cast. So whether that matches the picture in your head, and this is a really interesting thing to think about, you know, when you see a, a movie, it doesn't match the picture in your head of the story. So one of the other problems, Cara, is that we have worked through many scripts. So you've read one script and this one was quite different from the one that you read. And there's characters that are taken out of it and all that kind of stuff. So you're looking at something that's different. Yeah, I noticed that too. But it's interesting to see something in the very beginning and then yeah. watch it go through the process. So, yeah, exactly. and then when you see the end result, it'll be fun. Yeah, no, it was great. And there are a great bunch of people. And I, I kind of feel like, you know, it was time consuming, but I feel like everyone in the theater should almost be a part of that for every production because it gives you a good feel for like who's involved management wise and who actor wise and just more trying to understand the story like it's it's really helpful like I, I definitely so very interesting that you say that because exactly when I said sponsors for tours when you get when you get um, backers and you get people who are investing in theater and when I work professionally that moment of the first read through is when people who've donated a significant amount of money are invited to come to that exact event. Oh, interesting. So the theaters recognize that the, the people who've invested the money want to see where their money went and it becomes something of interest for them to come and meet not only the producer, because that's probably who contacted them for the money, but also, you know, the director, the actors, the designers, and then you do a design presentation, the actors are introduced, and then the actors read the play. And it, it feels like for the people who've invested their money that, ah, we, this is the early days. We have invested, we get to see what starts before we see the finished result. So that's something that you should think about when you're watching your movie musical is that is the final result. Right. And there's a significant amount of work that went into getting it to that point, so. Thanks for sharing that, Cara, and yeah. for just, you know, having having the uh, patience to be there as a three-hour meeting on Zoom, if you can imagine. And uh, no, it was really fun and really great people. It was, yeah. you know, I'm looking forward to the end result for sure. Yeah. So we're going to call it a day, and I'm just going to, I have a couple of breakout rooms open, so if you're just hanging around, I can stick you in one. Just, just let me know. Uh, you can raise your hand or something, and otherwise, just take off. And I'll see ya. Thank you. Thank you. See you on Tuesday. You. Yeah, I just had one question. It was about the, the the assignment due uh, was it next Thursday. Uh, so I just wanted to know whether we need to pick the movie version of the musical that we um, did the assignment about the previous assignment, or can it just be any um, movie musical? Yeah, that was the intent, was that you pick the, the musical that you chose for your a first assignment so that we build on it. it. It allows you to have some familiarity. If you decide that you hate it and you don't want to spend the time writing about it, pick something else. Okay. But do pick something that has come from a stage musical. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Thank you so much. I'll see you yeah, next week. Absolutely. Bye, Casper. Bye. Stay safe in Finland. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, Lisa. Lisa, say, say your name again. Oh, well. Oh, let me stop the recording. <laughs>